All right, so let's talk a little bit about uh, mastering light. That's what I want to talk about. And I think for those of you who uh, know me, I'm going to give the camera operators a workout today because I'm, I'm mobile at all times. Um, but for those of you who know me in my messaging, I'm usually talking about making money, right? I'm talking about business, uh, which I think is paramount to everything we're doing. So for those of you watching at home, for those of you watching here, uh, you, you can have all the great equipment in the world, but if you don't know how to make money, if you don't know how to bring customers into your studio, you're gonna be broke, right? You're gonna have a very expensive credit card bill uh, when it's all said and done. And so, but today, we're gonna talk about lighting. And so it's really interesting that as a business owner, uh, I think I'm very good at business, but I think lighting is also very important to what we do. And when we talk about lighting, there's ma many different things uh, that we should master. And mastering is, is such an interesting term, right? Seems simple enough to say, it's easy to say, right? Well, I'm gonna master that, I'm gonna be great at that. Uh, but what does that really mean when it comes down to execution of mastering really anything? Um, and so when we talk about mastering light, mastering light is something I think we spend all day chasing. If you're a photographer and you're an, a, a portrait photographer, if you're an outdoor environmental photographer uh, and you're working with light, you will spend your days chasing it, right? The light looks different at 6 a.m. Uh, than it does at 6 p.m. And New York City is the perfect city to understand what I mean by chasing light. Just as you're walking down the street, the light that's hitting buildings and reflecting, uh, the lights that uh, are streaming down one of the city streets, right? These are uh, what I, this is what I mean by chasing uh, light. And the light looks different whether it's uh, a sunny day uh, or a cloudy day, right? So as photographers, as artists, we really can't do anything without light. It's non-existent. Without light, we can't create. So we need it in one form or fashion. Now, I don't wanna to talk to you about mastering daylight, uh, really. I wanna to talk to you about mastering kind of flash photography, right? How do we, how do we create light uh, where maybe it doesn't exist the way we want it to? So there's endless sources and variations of light. Uh, there, it's all around us, but yet mastering it, I think like anything else, will end up taking an absolute lifetime. And so for those of you out there who don't know who we are, don't know really what we do, um, I'm a wedding and portrait photographer, I'm very active. I think if I'm gonna be up here teaching you and educating you, I should be doing it. Um, and so I've been doing it full time as a professional for 10 years. Uh, I started when I was 16, 17 years old. It's when I shot my first wedding, hated every minute of it. I never lie about it. Wedding photography back in the 1980s was not sexy, glamorous. Uh, it was uh, stressful, frustrating, traditional, uh, nothing that I enjoyed about it. And my family said, hey, you're gonna get a real job. You're not gonna be an artist. Uh, yet, ironically, here I am. And so today, I think wedding and portrait photography has changed. Uh, our bride and grooms give us a lot more latitude uh, to do creative things, right? It's not very traditional uh, where you just sit there, stand, uh, and pose for pictures, right? So many of you can identify your own style and, and bring it to life. Well, the same holds true for portrait photography, high school senior photography, commercial photography. They want personality in that, right? It's not just about uh, stand there, sit, pose, smile kind of deal. Um, and so understand that when I'm teaching you and talking to you about light and how we use it, understand it's coming from a place of experience that this is what I do uh, on, a, on a daily basis. And so we talk about mastering. I love showing pictures like this. This is, this is not flash photography, but this is something that after 10 years, I'm pushing myself and challenging myself to think differently about what I do. The, you know, I was talking to someone in the hall uh, before this class and we were talking about like our work from 10 years ago. And I, I think over the next year or so as I'm teaching, I'm gonna start bringing out my work from 10 years ago. Uh, because I think it'd be interesting to see what my work looked like when I started 10 years ago versus what it looks like today. It's, it's probably horrific. Uh, and so the editing was horrific, uh, the posing, the lighting, it was bad. I mean, I was starting out, I was learning. Uh, and then I look at where I am today. And, you know, this is a picture I took uh, last year in New York City. There was a wall, um, it's down in South Manhattan somewhere. Um, and it's, I saw this wall of light and I just wanted to play with it. And so... This is what mastering means to me. You may love this shot, you may hate this shot, I don't particularly care. Uh, why I'm showing you this shot is to understand that as an artist, if you wanna continue to grow, it's about being uncomfortable. It's about pushing yourself to do something different. Stop doing what's easy, right? And by the way, this isn't just with lighting, this is with life, really. If you wanna run a successful business, if you wanna be successful at anything, you have to challenge yourself to get uncomfortable, right? If you're not uncomfortable, you're not growing. That's usually the motto I, I live by, right? So make yourself uncomfortable. 
And the reason I'm showing you a shot like this is this took me two and a half hours to get this shot. One picture, two and a half hours. I had no idea what I was doing. I had no idea what I wanted. I just saw something and I wanted to experiment with it. It took me two and a half hours to make this one picture, okay? And so that to me is a testament. I want you to understand if you're starting out, if you're watching at home, I don't want you to believe any photographer you see that takes this, this stage. We didn't start here, right? We started there. We started with the same crappy photos that we all take. We started struggling with lighting. We started struggling with posing. We started struggling with communicating to our clients, but it's a life journey. And so you're seeing what I'm showing you here is my own experimentation with my own journey, right? So here, right, I'm playing with light and shadows uh, on an image like this. I wanted something that was a little bit fine art, something that was uh, a little less obvious on a bride and groom, uh, and that's, I'm experimenting, I'm trying to grow. This doesn't look, these two shots, if you see them, they don't look like my normal work, right? So you can see as an artist, I'm still trying to evolve and grow. And so remember what we're talking about. We're talking about mastering something. So how do you become the master of anything, really? It's such an interesting topic. Um, there used, uh, in 2008, uh, Malcolm Gladwell, he wrote a book uh, uh, called Outliers. And there was this rule he kind of served up, right? If you want to be a master of anything in life, you need to, you know, the, the common thread was people spend about 90 minutes a day doing a task for 20 years. And after 10,000 hours, you'll be a master of whatever it is you're, you're focused on. Well, of course, right, like anything else, that, that stats that get put out, people scoffed at it. You know, that ignores quantity versus quality. So if you're doing something 90 minutes a day for 20 years, does it really take you that long to become an expert or, or, or a master at that? And obviously, some would say yes, some would say no. Then Tim Ferriss, right, when his 40-hour work week, he comes along and he talks about meta-learning and that you could become world-class in anything in six months or less. Now, I don't know if that's true or not. I don't think you're gonna become world-class at anything in six months, but I think his point that he was trying to make was that you can accelerate your learning by doing certain things, by learning how you learn. Does that make any sense? So everybody in this room, everybody watching, you learn differently. Think about it. Some of you learn hands-on. Some of you learn by watching videos. Some of you learn by reading books. Uh, some of you maybe learn from all of the above. I learned by, by reading and doing. And so uh, my background, my pedigree, I worked for Microsoft for 10 years. And at Microsoft, they would get, give me a book, 600, if, if I've got any IT people out there, you know exactly what I'm talking about. New technology comes out and the Bible comes out, right? It's like 600, 800 pages of just nonsense in there, right? It's just all technical jargon. My job was to read that and become an expert very quickly on that product or service. So I learn by reading and then doing. And so I do that same thing in photography. I read about a concept, right? And then I go and I actually practice it. And so what you've got to do, if you want to accelerate your learning as we're talking about lighting specifically, right? If you're over, overwhelmed or overpowered by photograph, flash photography specifically, you've got to go read about it or let me, let me rephrase. You've got to figure out how you learn. Do you learn by watching videos? Do you learn by uh, going to workshops? Do you learn hands-on? What works for me isn't what's gonna work for you. The minute you figure out how you best learn and process information, you are suddenly going to accelerate your learning of any single topic. Is this making sense? So this is the kind of stuff you have to be able to do. So I think that to master your craft, right, you've gotta to commit to the journey of learning and teaching. So here's something else I've learned about myself. I learn by teaching. So when I'm working with students in a hands-on way and they come up to me with, I'm sure what might seem like a silly question to ask, for me, it reminds me of the basics. And so I find myself learning quicker by understanding what challenges you're facing as somebody who's now learning our craft, right? Because I'm like, oh, I forgot about that. You'd be surprised how many things I've forgotten uh, that I'm reminded of when I'm helping a student learn that. So, right, this is what I know about myself. So I know that by continuing to learn and teaching, that it helps me hone my craft. Uh, and so, I don't know, does that make me a master? Uh, I would say no. Uh, I don't think I will ever reach, and this is my mindset, I'm being completely raw with you. I don't believe I will ever reach that point of master, right? And, and take the word master, expert, whatever word you wanna plug in there. And it's my mindset, because I think as somebody in a technical realm, you have to be committed to a lifelong journey of learning. And the minute you put that in your head, you realize there is no destination. 
We're just signing up for a journey, right, in life. And I don't know how long some of you guys have been doing all this, but for me, when I started out, right, I started out in the days of film, the challenges that we had in the days of film are completely different than the challenges we face today in the digital world. Um, I don't know if they're harder or easier, it doesn't matter, they're just different, right? And so imagine if I thought, and we've all run into these people, right? I still run into them in my life. Uh, you know, I, I've been doing this 40 years. I start, I don't care when you started, man. Like none of that is relevant. Uh, what you did 40 years ago is not what we're doing today, right? Facebook didn't exist 40 years ago. Shooting for digital files didn't exist 40 years ago. The challenges we face today as business owners didn't exist 40 years ago. They're, they're different, they're evolving. And so I wanna be, as a business owner, as an entrepreneur, as a photographer, I wanna to continue to push the limits, I wanna to continue to grow uh, my business. So, right, if you want to master light, and we're gonna look at pretty pictures here in a second, everybody. Um, everybody's like, where are the pictures? <laughs> Promised pretty pictures, okay. Um, if you wanna master light, I think it starts with practice. I think it starts with you pushing yourself to do something different. So as you're sitting here, as you're watching at home, ask yourself, man, what's your rhythm? What do you, what do you normally do? Is it natural light? Uh, is it off-camera flash? Is it on-camera flash? Do something different, right? Experiment, and this is important, fail. If you don't fail, you're never gonna grow. It is that simple. And we don't have to be talking about photography. We could be talking about anything in life. You have to fail. You learn from your failure. Doesn't mean you have to like failure. Doesn't mean we have to accept failure. We just have to understand that it's part of the process. And then, of course, pick yourself back up, try again. Fail, try again, rinse, repeat. That's how it works. Get uncomfortable. So for those of you who are, and I'd ask for a show of hands, but I can't see into the back. But for those of you who are not using flash photography today, I know why you're not using it. You don't, you're not using it because you're afraid of it. You don't understand it, and that's okay. Everybody started there. What I'm encouraging you to do is get uncomfortable, start messing with it, take a picture of a soda can, man. Put a, put a bottle of water, a soda can, put it on a ledge and light that and see what you like and don't like about it. See what sucks and what's good about it. And from there, keep practicing. Then get a model. Get somebody you know who, who's, who you don't have to produce anything usable for them, right? And go, hey, I'm practicing today. If you don't mind joining me, why don't we run around the city? Let's do a couple of things. I'll rent a cool dress for you. Let's do something and go out there and shoot with one mission in mind for you. Fail. That's it, right? So this picture that I showed you earlier on, this was about failure. I think out of that failure, I found something that's pretty damn cool. But it was about failure. I didn't go out there for a client. I didn't go out there and say, I have to get this shot. That would have, that would have made me work completely differently. So instead, what I wanted to do was just get out there and try things and experiment. And that, I think, is what the, the journey's all about. And so I always love this. I always show something like this in, in my, uh, my presentations. Natural light photographer. That is nonsense. When you identify yourself as a natural light photographer, you are acknowledging you don't know jack about, I'd say another word, but I'm trying to keep it family friendly here today. But that means you don't know anything about lighting, okay? And that's fine, we all start somewhere, but it's like a chef saying, I'm only a salt and pepper chef, right? Lighting is one of your tools, and that's the reality of it, right? It's a tool in your toolbox. You have to know how to use all lighting. You may have a preference, you may say, I prefer to use natural light, that's okay, that's your style, right? I don't, I prefer actually a very hard edge, dramatic light. If you look at my work and my portfolio, my work is identifiable and that's by design. I wanted to have a very unique style that my clients would gravitate to, okay? Can I use natural light? Of course. Can I use a reflector? Of course. Uh, I know how to use all the tools that are out there and I'm still learning every day, but I would never identify myself as a flash photographer. Have you ever, I, I've never seen anybody identify themselves that way but yet you identify yourself this way as a natural life photographer because you don't really understand what, what you're doing. So let's fix that, get uncomfortable, learn something new. I don't think lighting's hard, okay? I think lighting is all around us. As professional photographers, we have to be able to work all day, every day. I talked about this a little bit this morning. Um, this concept of ideal conditions, soft light, golden hour, good luck. That is not how you're gonna run a successful business, right? You can't shoot one time a day during golden hour. Uh, for me, I'm shooting three to five photo shoots a day. I start at 9 a.m. and I'm shooting until 6, 7 p.m. The lighting conditions are changing all day long. And so as a working professional, if you wanna make money in this business of ours, and it's a great business, by the way, if you wanna make money at it, you have to be able to work all day long and create your own ideal, right, scenarios. And so lighting is hard is what we're always told, right? I think it's a lie. I think lighting's easy, it's around us, 
Use it, shape it, love it, right? Embrace light. And when you embrace that light, you'll start learning how to just kind of dance with it, right? Uh, I know it sounds like sexy and romantic, but maybe that's what we need to have in our head instead of being afraid of, of this thing we don't know. Um, but we've got to stop running from it. And again, I was talking about this earlier. It can be as simple or as complicated as you want. Light can be as simple as a reflector or open shade, or it can be as complicated as having a eight light setup in a studio, okay? You don't, you're not gonna wake up tomorrow and start with an eight light setup, that's not gonna happen. But you could wake up tomorrow and start with one light and then start building and then add an edge light, right? And then it, it, these are all things you can start doing. And sometimes you just have to use what you got. And so this, uh, this picture, I was on a shoot uh, about two or three weeks ago um, and I didn't have any of my gear with me. I had my camera, I had two lenses, uh, and that was it. And the, uh, I had two models we were working with, and they were getting ready in the room. Hair and makeup was just done. And I didn't want to send them outside. It was humid outside, uh, and I didn't want to ruin their makeup. And so I just wanted to do something cool in the room with them. And so what did we have available to us? If you look at the scene, the behind the scenes, not a very cool environment at all, right? So you've got this uh, white shear that we use to soften the light, right? Almost like a scrim. Uh, and then we've got this high-tech trash can uh, that we're using for fill uh, of the shot, and then this is what we're creating, okay? So I didn't have an eight-light setup in the studio. I had a simple setup. I had light coming in through a shear to soften it. I don't identify myself as a natural light photographer. I understand lighting. I've got a nice Rembrandt lighting uh, pattern across her face, I'm turning her into the light. I've got her posed in a nice way. She's giving the camera a good expression. Okay? These are the kind of things that I'm looking to do with what I've got in that moment. Okay? And so here's the reality check. We have to be able to work in all conditions, anywhere, anytime, natural light, continuous light, reflective light, flash. Uh, we cannot limit ourselves to one tool and call that natural light. We can't do it. And that's what I'm pushing on you to do. And so my goal today right, is to convey to you how to learn and go through that path of mastering whatever it is you're struggling with, whether you're struggling with lighting, posing, communicating. How many of you struggle just talking to your clients, right, and getting them to do what you need them to do? I'm not, again, I'm not even going to ask for a, a raise of hands. Photographers, very, uh, by their very nature, are very introverted, right? So we have a very difficult time communicating with people um, uh, what we're looking for out of them, right? But what you'll find is that the more you struggle communicating with your clients, whether these are wedding clients, commercial clients, models, wh whoever it is, the more you struggle communicating to them, the more awkward they become. And the more awkward they become, the more awkward you become. And it's this vicious circle because they don't understand what you're looking for out of them, right? You can't just say, hey, go over there and, and, and do this, right? I'm not a photojournalist. That's not my style of photography. You guys have been in this room five, 10 minutes now, and you could already tell. I will talk to anybody. I'll talk to anybody about anything. And so I love talking and meeting people I think that relationship is what it's all about, right? So I want you today, as you're sitting here watching, is to ask yourself, how do you learn? I'm going to help you showing you my work, the pretty pictures. Um, I'm going to break them down so that you can understand what I did to create those pictures and then go out and try and recreate them yourselves. I want you to dissect the shots, dissect the lighting so that you can understand. Then I want you to take this info and set up your own ideas and practice sessions. Look, there's all sorts of great classes that B&H is putting on here for you, right? All sorts of insightful information. But what are you going to do with it? Are you just going to leave here and do nothing with it? Well, then the joke's on you, right? What hopefully will happen is you will take this and 5 or 10% of you will. 95%, 90% of you will do absolutely nothing. I'll see you next year. We'll smile about it. You'll laugh. You'll be like, yeah, that, that, no, I didn't do shit. Um, and then we'll, we'll just go from there, right? I would rather see all of you take that information, challenge yourself, and do something uh, to push yourself to be, to be better. So get uncomfortable. There's no reason you can't walk out of here in the next three to five days, put, schedule practice shoots for yourself. There's just no reason. Find a friend, find a colleague, find someone's daughter, find someone's son, right? Find someone, get them in front of your camera and practice. And so here's what's in my arsenal uh, wherever I travel, really. So I've got six B1s, six A1s, I've got an extra battery for each. I work mobile. So I shoot weddings in New York. I shoot weddings in Chicago. I shoot weddings in St. Louis. I shoot weddings in LA. Uh, commercial work in all these cities. I can't be bogged down by equipment. And so for me, it's got to fit in a suitcase. And so this stuff is traveling with us in a checked bag. 
uh, for the most part. Not my camera equipment, but the B1s and all that stuff, we're checking that stuff. All right, the A1, uh, we've got an extra battery for each. In studio lights, I don't really use them anymore. I'm using my B1 as my studio light. There, what, what's the situation when I'm in a studio and I need more than 500 watts per second? Very, very rare, right? Maybe you're doing something where you're trying to freeze action and you really need to be faster. I don't have that situation, I'm doing portrait work. So the B1 has gotten rid of all the cords for me uh, in my studio and that's what I love about it. Uh, I use a portable beauty dish, both their OCF, which is collapsible, and their metal one. Obviously, if I'm traveling, the metal one cannot come with me. Uh, it stays back in my studio, but the portable one, it's a two-foot uh, two uh, portable beauty dish. It collapses flat, it's in my suitcase. Umbrellas, grids, gels, nano stands. This is something you should all invest in. So it's by Manfrotto. Uh, they're portable stands. They collapse to about this big, and they go six feet tall. So they completely collapse. I think they're, I'm probably making up prices, but I think they're in the $69 to $89 range. It's worth having in your bag because you don't want to put the uh, heavier light stands when you're traveling. And then, of course, reflector. I love working with reflectors. Silver and white is my color of choice. Uh, I'm not a real big fan of gold or any of the mixed uh, lighting. But you have to understand, for me, being, being working with Profoto is I'm investing in a system, right? The A1s work with the B1s, work with the A1s. So everything is interchangeable for me. So I'm not like, oh, I'm in this situation, I gotta have 10 speed lights with this set of gels and kits. Oh, I'm in a studio situation, I've gotta have studio lights with this separate set of gels and soft boxes. So this is a system in my world that works cohesively together. Think of it like an ecosystem. When it comes to camera gear, this is what's in my bag at any given moment in time. Canon 5D M4, it's a workhorse for me. So I have it, Alyssa has it. This is what I'm using on my commercial shoots, on my destination shoots, right? I do have uh, other cameras, but this is my workhorse. Uh, 7200-2.8 and 85 millimeter 1.2 are my go-to lenses. Even though I've got a bag filled with primes, this is what I'm using 90% uh, of the time, right? 24 millimeter, 35, 50, 100 millimeter, and then of course 24, 70, 11, 24. If you're a wedding photographer, I think you've gotta have a range of lenses. I would say, if I'm a wedding photographer, I'd wanna have an 1124, 2470, 7200 to start. That gives you an entire range of wide to tight, okay? Then as you go to add, I would add an 85 millimeter lens. An 85 millimeter lens is a gorgeous portrait lens. I mean, there's just nothing like it. You don't wanna take portraits with a 2470. It's just not gonna give you the same uh, look and feel. You can do it, if that's your style and you wanna get a different look and feel out of the, out of the uh, subject in your lens. But as a general rule, I like kinda of compressing that background a little bit uh, and keeping all the, the nose, the eye, I wanna keep everything looking as it does, right? I don't wanna skew any of that stuff. So, now we get to pretty pictures. Um, I'm gonna show you three types of work. One, right, cause we're talking about mastering light. One with reflectors, one with the A1, and one with the B1X. And the reason I'm presenting them the way I am is because that's kind of the progression you will go through when you're working in the field. What's the lighting situation? Okay, can we work with the available light that's here? Boom, we're gonna bring in a reflector. All right, well, we're in open shade, but maybe it's a cloudy day and we, need, we got shadows under the eyes. Uh, we need the A1 uh, to give us a little bit more pop of light in there, right? We're not trying to overpower the sun. We're not in these bright lighting conditions, great. Okay, well, maybe it's a bright sunny day, blue sky, no clouds in the sky, the A1's not gonna work, that's not what it's meant for. Now we would have the B1, which has got 500 watts of power, and now we're using it there. So we're gonna go through this step by step to make sense uh, of all this. So, first up, let's just talk reflector. All right, so even if we look at this original shot here for the title page, sun's back behind them, right? So we don't have any hard shadows on their face, and we're just using a reflector to push a little bit of light uh, into, into, their, uh, into their face. But here's our first shot. So we're out in the desert. This is taken with an 85 millimeter lens. Uh, the light is camera right. Right, we see our subject and we've got a reflector just off camera left. So if we go back and look at that. Okay, now we can see we're having her look into that light, right? If she looks at me straight on at the camera, we're gonna get split light there, right? I can't move the sun. And you might be thinking, well, why don't you just move your subject? Okay, well, what if I move my subject or I move and off to the right there, right, if I put the sun directly behind her, there's a car parking lot. 
right? So I can't necessarily move my subject. So you've got to understand that the conditions are what they are. They're going to give you what they give you, and you have to be able to work in whatever condition is there in front of you. And it's understanding these lighting techniques that are going to help you be successful. And so that's how we lit that. Now, high school seniors. This is our number one style of portrait for a high school senior, right? She's standing in open shade, but if I were to take this picture alone, she's gonna have, her eyes are not gonna pop. You can see where the reflector is right under her eyes. And so what we do is we take that reflector and we're putting it right, under, right at her belly. And so I'm shooting this with an 85 millimeter lens, okay? And the reflector is right at her belly and you can see the catch lights in her eye, right? So we're using silver, no direct sunlight. She's in open shade, which is also interesting, right? A lot of times when people use a reflector, I think they make a big mistake. They pull out the reflector and they're like, where's the sun, right? And you just start blasting that reflective light into your clients, right? And it's just like, it's like you just start melting them off the ground, right? Like just, dude, feather it in, soften it up a little bit, right? So we use a reflector in open shade and because it's so close to our subject, it's gonna give that natural reflective light into them. That is our number one selling portrait for high school seniors. Same thing, there's a high school senior. She's standing in open shade, and you could again see the catch lights in her eyes. So the reflector is right there next to her, pushing that reflective light uh, up to her. What does it look like here? It looks horrible on my monitor. And so now you can see where it is. Again, high school senior, Right? We're really tight, close with them. We're not, we're not pulling away full body shots with that reflector in open shade. It's not going to throw enough light. We know this. But we're, we want their eyes to pop. Right? You see pictures like this all the time. You're like, oh, that's Photoshop. It's not, it's not Photoshop. It's a freaking reflector. So you're putting it where it belongs. You can see the catch lights right in her eye. Sun is uh, to, off to the right. She's in a sliver of open shade. And we're filling that to get it in her eyes. I showed this picture earlier uh, this morning. I love this picture. Probably I'm just connected to it. Um, you know, it's one of those things where maybe it's not the best picture in the world, but you get connected to it. We were standing, uh, it, we were in Northern California. Um, I'm going to say it wrong. Land of the Giants. I don't know, the big giant trees. We'll go with that. Am I, am I, what is it? What, Red, it's not the Redwood Forest. Avenue, Avenue of the Giants. Uh, I always say it wrong. It's in the, I think it's part of the Redwood Forest, right? I'm a New Yorker. It's big trees. Um, <laughs> So, uh, so they had these big trees, um, and you know, I love the, the contrast of it, right? We've got this small subject standing in this vast landscape, but here's what made this uh, image fun for me. There was a like three to five minute window where a sliver of sunlight peeks in through the trees. That is what's lighting her on camera right. Camera right is no artificial light source. Uh, it is she's looking right towards the sun that is peeking through the trees. What we did here was we grabbed a reflector uh, off on camera left because what was happening here was her entire left arm was going into shadow. The monitors are really contrasty, so bear with me. Her entire left arm was going into shadow. And so we wanted to push light onto the left side of that image. And so you'll see uh, that the left side of her body does in fact have light on it. And the reason for that is because of the reflector. So just a simple reflector there was able to push in some light on her. So what we're doing here is we're looking at stuff like this and understanding that re reflective light is a simple thing to do to take those images to that next level. Just give it a little bit different uh, of a look. And so here, same thing. We've got our couple, and this was, this was actually for a workshop I was teaching in, uh, in Italy. And all we had access to was this field with lemon trees, uh, and, you know, we didn't have any open shade to work with. We were on a farm. And they're like, how can we do something here, even in these conditions? And so this particular setup, okay, we have the, the couple standing together. The sun is left. And so as you start looking at this image again, you'll see that that sun is coming in from the left. And what I managed to do to work with that sun was rotate them just enough so we still had the trees where they needed to be, and enough light was hitting them, okay, without blinding them. And then what we did was, in order to lift the shadows on his face and the backside of her dress and veil, okay, is we used a reflector to push that light into it. Now, of course, we've edited out 
uh, Alyssa from the scene uh, because she was standing there in between the two trees, by the way. That's how close she was with the reflector to fill in some of that light on his face so it wasn't in complete shadow and her, the backside of her so it wasn't in complete shadow. So what you're seeing again is with reflective light, how we're able to do some really simple stuff, okay? So when we're going through this kind of like mastering step by step, it definitely starts with natural light. But now we have to up our game. How do we take it to that next level? Here's where a product like the A1 for me comes into play. So for the A1, here's what I like about it. A1 is a rechargeable and swappable battery. 1.2 second recycle time at full power. So do we have an A1 in here? Anybody? Pro photo in the room? Oh, thank you. They love when I just say, we need this, and I never told anybody. Um, 1.2 second recycle time, okay? It's got an LED modeling lamp that you actually can use, right? It'll kill the battery real fast, but you can use it. I've used it for like ring shots, detail shots, just turning on the LED modeling light, okay? But I don't wanna miss shots when I'm in the field. I also don't wanna wait for AA batteries to take five seconds to recycle. And that's how long it will take for AA batteries to recycle, I know, because I've tested it. This is recycling at full power, 1.2 seconds. If you're shooting at half power, it's, it's negligible. You're not missing a shot. It's just recycling for you very, very quickly. And so let's talk about when I would actually use uh, the A1. Open shade. Remember, I am not trying to overpower the sun with an A1. It's not gonna happen. It doesn't even make sense. It's the wrong tool for the job. And so I'm using it in open shade. I'm using it to fill. So if I have somebody standing in a situation where there's just open shade on their face, I don't wanna use a reflector. Maybe the reflector's too harsh. I just want to have a little bit of pop, a little bit of fill. I'm using it indoors. Indoors, A1, all day long. That is my new, like, mini mobile studio go-to. So I'm going to show you some pictures from a commercial shoot I did last week. So I only had a chance to edit two of the pictures, but we ran the whole set all day with uh, three A1s, never had to change the batteries. Thank you, sorry. And so when we're looking at the A1, right, I'm at a power of, uh, I'll just go to five. It's just gonna keep firing. You should be impressed by that because I know your AA batteries can't do it, right? And so uh, I was driving my, my, my team fan, uh, crazy uh, because I'm sitting in my office with uh, right speed light and this, and I'm just trying to power them and recycle. And of course I had the beep on, which was making everybody even more nuts, right? Because then you know when it's actually recycling, uh, fully recycled. And so when I'm using this, and I'm gonna show you the pictures we created. There's only, this is all I use, by the way. So I'm using this light and this uh, dome diffuser, okay? This will soften the light. It's magnetic head, uh, and so there's a lot of other features. You can go to the Pro Photo booth and play with it. I highly encourage you to play with it. Uh, battery comes out, so it's a rechargeable battery. You're done, okay? It is a simple to use product, uh, which is also why I like it. And then, of course, there's your modeling light. All right, so now we're just one button and we're hitting that modeling light, and the modeling light can be uh, full power, it can match the power of the strobe. So this is what I use uh, when I'm on location. So here's a picture. This was from a commercial shoot we just shot for a magazine. Uh, we got an eight page spread uh, in a magazine. She's being lit camera right with a Profoto A1. CTO gel, uh, this is a karaoke bar in St. Louis, it is the most lavish karaoke bar I've ever seen in my life. Like, it, you have private karaoke rooms. Do they have that here in, in New York? Is that a thing? Yeah. You, do, you do it? Like, that's your thing on the weekends? <laughs> I get it. I get it. I mean, I saw these rooms. I'm like, I don't karaoke, but I could get into karaoke. Um, so we were doing a fashion shoot at this karaoke bar. All sorts of reflections going on uh, in here where we want to control light. So we had the a A1, right, flagged so that we're, not, we're trying to control as much light spill and bounce as we possibly can. Uh, and so I love this shot. She's being lit with one A1 CTO gel. This shot, I love. So she's being lit, again, with one A1 from the front, right? It's flagged uh, and with the dome diffuser. That's how we're lighting her. And so this, I'm not bringing in studio strobes. I mean, you can look at this hallway Look how narrow that hallway is. You think you're rolling into that hallway? 
with a B1 and an Octabox and all this other madness, it's not happening, man. You, all you're gonna see is light everywhere, okay? So in a situation like this, this little bad boy is giving me everything I need in that situation. Now granted, this is a commercial shoot. So this isn't even a wedding day. So on a wedding day, I've got even more latitude here. I had to be able to move quickly uh, to be able to get what I wanted. I'm balancing it with the ambient light. That's what you're seeing that's going on behind her. So we're not just overpowering the room. Uh, and so that, to me, that's pretty impressive for just one light lighting her up with no other light modifier other than this dome diffuser. So this is what you gotta start keeping in mind. I'm gonna show you more pictures. Uh, this is a recent shot. I think it won third place at WPPI or second place, I can't remember. Bride alone, wedding day. Uh, monitors are showing a little bit more saturated than it is. That's probably closer to real color above me. Um, this is 1A1. So this is a real wedding day. Uh, the bride, I run up to her ready room to tell her the ch church was really dark, and I, I ran up to the ready room just before she was coming down, and I wanted to tell her, hey, don't run down the aisle. If you're a wedding photographer, you know what I'm talking about. The faster they're moving, the blurrier their pictures get. Uh, so I like to tell my brides, hey, just step, step, step. I give them a cadence to come to so I can get pictures that are not blurry. So as I walk into this room, I see this ornate uh, wall of, of stained glass. I'm like, oh my God, I'm looking around. Only thing I have... Uh, at the time was 1A1 in my, in my bag. So I used this uh, and we fired the one light and it was from camera left, firing it across, lighting her sister's face, hitting the mirror for some light to bounce off into the bride's face, okay? And so again, one light we're using to get the results that we're looking for. Same thing, real wedding. So I just shot this wedding up in New Hampshire uh, I wanted to do something creative for the client. They are standing behind a frosted glass window. Um, it's a reception hall. It's a historic building in New Hampshire. And uh, we couldn't go outside. The Nor'easter, this was just about a, a month ago, I think, maybe a month and a half ago. Um, but the Nor'easter uh, had hit the Northeast, and they were uh, 50 mile an hour winds outside. So we weren't going outside. It was freezing, it was windy, hair was going all over the place. But I, I wanted to still do something artistic for them. And so this is 1A1. Okay, firing on the wall behind them with a CTO gel. And of course, color temperature is about 5,000, 5,500, because I wanted that orange to remain to balance with the purple uplighting that was in the room. So the purple uplighting is like you're seeing here in this room, right? So they had this purple wash over the walls. Uh, I, I didn't want to lose that. I wanted to keep that purple wash, and then the orange light, I, I like the way that looks. So here was the lighting setup for that. So we're just using that 1A1 and firing it into that wall. And I hope what you're getting out of all this is understanding that creating great light, remember in the beginning, I said it could be as complicated or simple as you make it. A lot of times, I think as photographers, we manage to overcomplicate literally everything, right? We walk into a scene and we're like, um, oh my God. Uh, I mean, there's, there's green light in the back, there's orange. I, I, can't, I can't work in these conditions, right? Uh, we, we manage to do that with literally everything we do, right? So you gotta, sometimes you gotta dumb it down, keep it simple. This was a situation where I was not going to fight with the purple wash in the room, right? I wasn't going to try and get them to be more visible than they were because it's frosted glass, right? I'm not going to like press their faces against the glass. I wanted something that was framed up beautifully with the curtains, right? I wanted some color back there. I didn't want it to be white. I knew that. White, if you, if you can envision this in your mind, you can see that the white if we went white with that, it, would, it wouldn't have the same impact, right? It needed a color of some sort. I could have used colored gels, of course. We could have gone red or blue, but it wouldn't have had the impact. So I felt like yellow was that perfect balance of color, right, that works for, works for this scene. Here's another case in point. There's a real wedding in Miami. We just shot this uh, in January, February, down in Miami, open shade. Okay, so the sun is behind them. You can see it uh, lighting up trees behind them. There's no natural light on their face. I could have gone into this. I, I think this was shot with a 35 millimeter lens, um, uh, 35.14, and I think I shot it at 2.0 or, or 2.8. Don't, don't have the exact specs. It's irrelevant. Uh, what we did, though, is it's 1A1, yet again. 1A1, dome diffuser on it, uh, my assistant standing right over the camera, firing it to light them and make sure we don't have bags under their eyes, dark circles under their eyes. So you're seeing how I'm using the A1. I'm using it, right, outdoors especially, I'm using it to create fill so that we don't have those dark circles under their eyes and it just looks like an amateur shot, right? I wanted to have that polished shot where you're looking at it and I always love when people are like, 
oh, you, you photoshopped that, right? You dropped him in there. You fo no, dude, we were there. But the light creates that separation of the subject. And so you just got to know how to use, right, and master that light. Here's another shot from the same wedding. So I'm going to drop back to the, the uh, before shot. And so what you're seeing here, what I like to do on a wedding day is not inconvenience my clients. Okay, because I've got all these grandiose ideas that I see in my head, but I got to remember that my clients have spent tens of thousands of dollars on the wedding, so I can't hijack them the entire uh, wedding. This was at a very high-end venue in Miami, um, and so they spent a lot of money. So what I did was I went out into the hallway, and I got dialed in on my light. I got dialed in on my framing, my, le my lens choice. Everything was ready to go. And what you're seeing there is right off camera left, the A1 on a monopod with... You can see it, just a dome diffuser. This is it, man. This is like my go-to 90% of the time right now. And so it's sitting there on a monopod, of course, uh, CTO gel. Alyssa's holding the light to get it up high. We don't want the light source firing from down here, right? That's amateur hour, right? That light source should be coming from up above. It's not a horror movie. And so uh, we, we set this up. We get the bride and groom out. Boom, final shot. Okay, so we set it up. Everything was ready to go. Of course, the picture since been edited. We removed out the uh, A1 from the shot, but this is how I work. So I'm giving you kind of insight into my methodology, right? You can call it madness, whatever you want to call it, but this is how I work on a wedding day uh, with real clients, right? So I'm not just showing you this conceptual stuff. I'm showing you real work that we're doing. Same thing here. Okay, a real wedding couple. We use a Profoto A1 off camera. It was off camera right. Dome diffuser in gel, 5D Mark IV, 7200, right? That's not a Photoshop sky, that's a real sky. Um, there's a five minute window where we were shooting here in uh, Salt Flats in Utah, where the window goes, where the color of light, the sky changes to a pinkish blue. Man, I better talk faster. All right, here we go. Sal Sankata in one hour, that is a miracle. All right, so this is also Iceland. Same thing, one pro photo, A1, uh, dome diffuser and a gel. You're gonna keep seeing it. A1, dome diffuser and a CTO gel. A1, dome diffuser, CTO uh, gel, right? That is that is what I'm using uh, to create these shots. This isn't Photoshop. She's not dropped into the land, uh, you know, uh, uh, volcanoes. She's really there, I'm really there. She's being lit with fill light, okay? So same thing here. This, this is A1 on camera, something I would have never done prior to having the A1 in my hands. That is being lit with an A1 on the top of my camera. So 5D Mark IV, 85 millimeter 1.2. This was shot at 1.2, all right? So it's got that beautiful, milky look to their skin uh, because of that shallow depth of field. Same thing, we were in Chinatown shooting. I don't know if any of you have had an opportunity to uh, shoot there, but here we are again for this particular shot. Uh, we've got an A1, Alyssa's holding it off camera left. The A1 on my camera is acting as a trigger, right, because that A1's not going to reach from there. And then on the edge lights behind them are two B1s. So one B1 on each side, there's your final shot. 24-70 lens. Same thing, I go outside, okay, you're seeing it again. Behind the scenes, Alyssa's holding that A1, right, this is your city. You know how fast paced this city is, how much, how, how quickly you have to be able to move. So, right? so I wanted to showcase the energy. I wanted to showcase the, the, the colors. I didn't want to lose the sky. You know, I don't know if you can see it on your monitors, but uh, the sky, the steam coming off the ground is in the image. And that's because this was handheld at a 25th of a second. Okay, so F5, 25th of a second. But look at the details. I wanted to have those cars moving. I wanted to show the energy of the city. I didn't want to stop and freeze everything. That's not New York City. New York City's always in motion, so I wanted to show it. I'm going to skip that one. It's the same. Sorry, guys. I'm trying to be conscious of time. All right, same thing. So we're in Iceland here. Here we have two A1s. I've got an A1 lighting the groom. A1 lighting the bride, CTO gel to warm it up and cool down the scene. Again, I'm making conscious decisions here on how to use light and how to use gels. Uh, of course, we're going to edit out the people holding the lights and the light stands uh, in, in uh, the next shot, right? We'll edit them, edit them out for the final shot. This was shot with a Profoto A1, 
phase one IQ3, so it's a 100 megapixel image. That's why you're seeing that dynamic range uh, on the shot. All right, one more from the A1. I love this shot. This was for a commercial shoot uh, that we did. Uh, so the chair, I'm still trying to get into my office. I think people would listen to me more if I sat and just gave orders from that chair. Um, but Alyssa won't let it happen. So she's being lit with one A1 camera left. It's creating that hard shadow, something I was going for. And there's a B1 with a purple gel lighting up the back wall. So you can see this was shot with an 85 millimeter 1.2. Um, on the shot, again, I told you this is one of my favorite lenses. It was shot at 1.2, um, and that's your, that's your final shot. Okay, last thing I want to talk about, B1X. Okay, so now remember, we're stair-stepping through this. We looked at reflectors, we looked at A1s, but now we got to look at the B, B1X, right? And so this, when am I using this? You've got 500 watts of power, swappable batteries again, up to 325 full power flashes. So very rarely am I using anything in studio other than my B1. Not, I'm not doing it. I have the D-line, I don't use it. I'm using the B1 in studio. 99.9% .9 of the time it's giving me what I need and I don't have cords all over the place. So when am I gonna use it? Of course, in studio and on location, uh, I use it when I need all the light shaping tools that Profoto offers, right? The soft boxes, the beauty dishes, things that are gonna give me more control and shape over the light. Uh, and then, of course, in bright lighting conditions. Perfect case in point. This is uh, Miss Iceland. She just finished uh, competing uh, in uh, Vegas, I think she was. Uh, this is, the sun is directly behind her. She's being lit with 1B1 and the beauty dish, the OCF two-foot beauty dish, because I was traveling with it, uh, from the front. That's it. That's the only light source we had on her. Same thing. We're out in harsh lighting conditions. The sun is directly behind the bride. You can see the shadow on the ground. The shadow is the biggest tell when you're trying to figure out where the light's coming from, right? So she's being lit with a B1 camera right with a magnum reflector. That magnum reflector is going to give you one, one and a half stops more power of light off that B1, which makes it start operating, right, like a thousand watt light uh, just by adding that magnum reflector. She's also being lit with a B1 from behind to soften the shadows. I don't, for this particular shot, I didn't want a hard shadow uh, behind her. So we're lighting her from the right and lighting her from behind to fill in that and make the scene look a little bit more even and balanced. Same thing here. This is Miss Iceland. So we are out in harsh lighting conditions. There's a rock in the middle just off to the right where you will see a very dark shadow on the ground. Again, that will tell you where the sun is. That sun is off to the right. We turned her away from the sun and we're using a B1 with a beauty dish to light her from the front and soften out and even all those shadows uh, on the front side of her. So you're starting to see my technique when I'm working in direct sun. I put the sun behind them to create that edge light and then I'm lighting them from the other side. Same thing here. These are good friends of mine, Mike and Jen. We were in Paris. Where's that sun? Can't miss it. Sun is on the left. Where's the shadow? Shadow's going, uh, coming from the, the left to right. So I'm using a B1 uh, bare bulb in this case to light them from there. A maternity shoot. So now we're outside again, you're seeing the shadows. You're seeing, by the way, somebody asked me when I was showing this image earlier, why so much negative space? I am, if it's one thing I know I'm good at, it's composition. It's something I see naturally when I walk onto a scene. And so for me, I think about leading lines and how I'm leading them from left to right, right? Your eye visually goes from left to right. All those stairs, you can't miss it. They're leading lines, very natural. But the one that's not so obvious is that hard shadow behind them. That hard shadow behind them is a shadow of the building, and it's bringing your eye from the top set of steps right down to her shoulders, right? That was by design. I could have put them anywhere. I could have moved them to the left. I could have moved them more to the right. I chose to put them there because I needed a way to not just have a bunch of bright steps behind them. I wanted to have something that was driving us right to them. And then, of course, they're being lit with a B1X uh, from the front. Now, here we are with a B1 set up indoors. So this was uh, at an Airbnb I was at, uh, and I saw these canary chairs, and I'm like, I gotta find a way to use them. And so we have a B1 on a beauty dish, camera left, and then we have a B1 gelled in the back room to create that silhouette, right? This was, this is a perfect case of me experimenting. This wasn't a paid shoot. This was me practicing. 
And so I wanted to try something different. I'd never done anything like this. If you look at my portfolio of work, none, you will see nothing that looks like this because this for me was an experiment. I don't want to experiment on my bride's wedding day. I wanted to do something a little bit different uh, and try out what if we created a silhouette? What if we open the door? What if we close the door? How do we tell a little bit of a story uh, about them? Same thing here. We're working with Jell. She's being lit with a B1 camera right uh, with a beauty dish. In studio, we're using a B1, right? So this was for a family shoot. They wanted something that was very much Annie Leibovitz, Vanity Fair style for their kids. Uh, so they're being lit with that kind of lighting setup. There's a B1 uh, above with an octobox, okay? And then there's a, a B1 beauty dish uh, firing in to fill in the shadows on the front, uh, front side, okay? So here you're seeing the versatility in that system. Same thing, we're in Iceland. It's a B1 on the left with a beauty dish uh, firing in and lighting her, lighting the entire left side of her body and then illuminating that veil so that that veil is not falling into shadow either. Show you this one. Same technique, right? You should start getting old. You should start being able to look at images and dissect them and understand what we're doing. Where's the sun here? Where's the sun? Left, right? Sun is on the left. That's what's giving her her hair light and edge light and separation. We're using a B1 camera right to light all those shadows. So because the right side of her body is in even shadow, we can use a strobe to fill that. If I turned her the wrong way and she had split lighting, it's gonna be very difficult for me to get the B1 or any light for that matter to even all that out. It's gonna be a lot of work, work I don't have to do. Why make it tough on myself, make it easy and do something like this. Last picture, this was in uh, Japan, same concept, right? This is a B1 with a uh, beauty dish, right? You're gonna keep hearing this formula. B1 with a beauty dish, uh, lighting her from the front left. She's looking right into it. She was in an open shade area, so it was very easy to use that light uh, to fill and light her up. Wow, thank you everybody. That, that was a miracle in, of itself. I can take like two, two or three questions. Any questions? Speak up, forever hold your peace. Go ahead, hold on, go ahead. So the question is, do I usually use a light meter or no? Uh, the answer is no. If I'm in studio, 100% of the time I'm using a light meter. In the field, I'm not, I can't move quick enough. And let me tell you why. Uh, I've been doing this long enough with the equipment where you know how it's gonna perform. So if I'm outside on a bright sunny day, Alyssa knows that that B1 is gonna be at a power setting of 10, and she's gonna be about eight feet away from the subject because of the way I light things, right? She knows she's not trying to overpower the sun, she's trying to fill. That just comes from experience. Um, if I start using a light meter in the field, it would start slowing everything down. So just experience gets me dialed in, and usually with like one or two test shots, I'm dialed in, right? I'll take it, I'll be like, no, the light's too hot. Now if the light's too hot, we have a choice. She can back up or turn down the power. I'm gonna opt to turn down the power so it recycles faster. Does that make sense? Question. So the question is which beauty dish do we use? Yes, it's the two foot OCF, which is the collapsible one. It's the easiest one for me to travel with. I gotta be honest with you, I love the full size one they have, but of course if I'm getting on a plane or something like that, I can't travel with it. But I'm telling you, the OCF uh, one with the uh, diffusion sock over the front of it, it's gorgeous, you, you're seeing the results. Yeah, question. Iceland with the train. Oh, with the veil. I was thinking like a real train. This one. Oh, you're talking about the one where it's curved? Yeah, I know, go ahead. No, that one was a B one. Yeah, so this particular shot, uh, I'll get to it, my apologies. You are talking about this one, yeah? Yeah, this particular shot, the A1 would not put out enough power or spread uh, to cover that area. And so on this particular shot, we had the B1 on a nano stand. That's another question I get asked. They're like, you put the B1 on a nano stand? I mean, dude, that nano stand is like, eh, bent. I mean, it's just ready to snap. But yes, we use it, um, and it's got the beauty dish, again, uh, softening that light across, right? Because if I had lit her with just a B1, bare bulb, 
the light would be much harsher in, uh, in the shadow con uh, areas, the contrast areas. So I need it to be softer and wider. So we put it in that, that beauty dish, pull it further away, and that's how we're getting that light illuminated. Because the light in the sky is what you're seeing. So if we didn't have that light hit that veil, that veil would be in shadow. It would look, it would look bad. This one? Talk to me after. Same concept, though, probably, but talk to me after. Yeah, any other questions? We good, we good, we good? All right, you guys, guys at home, thank you very much for being here.